like to invite you to take your copy of God's Word and join me in turning to the New Testament Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. We were in Matthew 6 last week. We're going to back up a few verses. And uh, there's a lot that I love about this nation in which we live. One of my favorite things about the United States of America is the fact that we have the freedom in this nation to gather as we are now for me to say, would you take your copy of God's Word for us to read the Bible, have God the Spirit reveal truth to our lives. We can live it out in obedience obedience and we're grateful that we live in a nation that provides us the freedom to do that. No nation in the history of the world has enjoyed the ascendance that our nation has. We've been blessed in incredible ways. We've been blessed with prosperity. We've been blessed with strength. Uh, Historically, we've been blessed with a relative peace and It's my belief that many of the blessings we've seen in this nation in which we live can go back to the the foundation where much of the foundation, the structure, the thoughts were based and premised upon God's holy word. We live in strange times. Uh, Routinely, I'll preach and someone will take issue with something I've said. That's fine. If you have a question, ask it. We could talk about it. But it's interesting. We live in a time where someone could say, I'm grateful for this nation in which we live. And, and there will generally be somebody nearby who will say, yeah, well, it's not perfect. I always think when I hear that, well, neither are you. And I like you, you know, I didn't know that was the standard for appreciation of something. It had to be absolutely perfect. Of course, we're not a perfect nation. But what I know to be true is this, we are a blessed nation, and I'm grateful for the freedoms we have in America. We've received so much. And Jesus told us that for those who've received much, there was an expectation. There was something that was to come from their life. And in Luke 12, Jesus said this, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Jesus teaches us that when we receive blessings, there are responsibilities that come with them. John F. Kennedy famously said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. He too was implying that we are a blessed people and that brings responsibilities. Now there are many incredible things that Americans can do to be supportive and helpful and encouraging to this nation in which we live. But I'm not talking this morning to America in general. I want to share with you today something that only Christians can do to help their country. There are many things that can be done, but you must be a Christian to do what it is we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about our responsibility to pray for our country. We're in the midst of this series simply entitled, The Way to Pray. We started it by coming to understand the one to whom we pray. It's about a relationship, not a recipe. We talked recently about about how to to pray. I think today we're going to see why. In part, we're going to discover why is it that we need to be people of prayer. And with this national holiday on all our minds, I think this is a great time to address this subject Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be. If if you're able, I'd like to invite you to join me in standing out of respect for the reading of God's Word. If you're glad to be in church, say amen. Amen. If you're glad we have tri-tip barbecue sandwiches awaiting us when I'm done, say amen. Amen. You know, let's just skip this time. Let's get straight to the sandwiches. I've had to smell those things all morning. We'll get to them in time, but we're going to feast in the Word for a little bit this morning. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think Uh, that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. And the verse goes on. And we've spent time from verse 9 down, and this morning I wanted to back up and see those verses leading into it. Uh, I want you to notice... Near the beginning of verse 5, we read these words, when thou prayest. Near the beginning of verse 6, we read these words, 
when thou prayest. In verse 7, we read these words, when you pray. I want to talk to you today about when you pray and make special application on this holiday weekend to how we pray for America. Our Father, we're grateful to be in this place today. Thank you for each person here. Lord, what a great joy and privilege is ours to worship you and to do so together. Give me clarity of thought and courage uh, and unction of the Spirit. May we leave this service today uh, more prepared to live for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. For those who pay attention to such things, it's not hard to discern that there are a lot of changes taking place in our world. A lot of shifts are, are happening. In fact, the structures that have been in place really since World War II are, are, are being changed and, and moved. We're seeing that happen in the world today. Our influence as a nation, we know, is, is diminishing. We are seeing that happen in real time. And and yet at the same time, in our country internally, there is, there is quite a struggle ongoing and there are major transformations taking place in the heart of this country. A recent headline I read stated this, and I'm quoting, this was the, the title of the headline, nearly 70% of young people support socialism and know they won't grow out of it. So I read that, I thought, well, that's interesting, that has not been our, our model, that's not been our form, but it illustrates that a massive shift in the way people think is, is underway. Much of the changes that are happening today, I'm afraid, go back to really more of a Marxist worldview that's being pushed out and perpetuated, and we know that is a view that is contrary to the Word of God. People of faith are to live with a biblical worldview. We evaluate what's happening in our world and in our lives through the lens of Scripture, and, and we see really the antithesis of that so much emerging in America today. It's more of an anti-Christ type of a mindset. I heard someone in an interview recently boast that those who support these changes that lead away from how it is our nation was founded, that they have more education. And, and the not so subtle point being made there was that if you're not willing to go along with these tides that are moving in a different direction, that you somehow are unintelligent and ignoramus, uneducated. When I heard that, all I could think is, you know, it's interesting. A lot of those kids go to places of education. That's where they learn that stuff. The education is really where it comes comes from. It seems many times we've seen that what once was education has turned into indoctrination and numerous studies have revealed, and Jeremy and I wrote about it in our last book, Offensive Faith, that so many of those who teach in higher education, the overwhelming majority are people with a worldview very different from one that we've known in our nation before. Now, I'm not here today as a politician. If anything I said has aggravated you to this point, you maybe get aggravated too easily. I've stated fact. I'm not here as a politician today. That's not my interest at all. I'm a pastor. God called me to preach the word of God. I'm preaching to Christians living in America, and I want to talk to you today about prayer and, and why it is that we should be people that pray for our land. Again, as a pastor, I view these things and, and I see how the tension and the animus towards people of faith, towards God's word, it's increasing, growing. It could leave us wondering at times, well, what are we supposed to do? I believe this text will help us today see what it is that we are to do. The Bible teaches us that we are to pray. So we get to God's word. Here's the first thought I'll share with you this morning. Number one, we must pray because God commands it. Because God commands it. I remember growing up, there were times where my mom would say, hey, Stephen, you need to get in here and do this, clean room, do that. And she'd give me her commands. And, and on occasion, I would ask her, Mom, why? And she was patient. She'd sometimes give me answers. But there were those times she said, because I'm the mom, that's why. You know, That typically ended the conversation. And if it didn't, later, Dad would say, because she's the mom, that's why. All right, And he'd, he'd back up Mom. And really, as we come to this matter of prayer, I, I, I think it's important for us to understand God says that we are to pray. I want you to know today that prayer is to be such a central part of the life of a Christian that it's just presumed that all Jesus followers will pray. In verses 5, 6, and 7, we read these words, when you pray. It's not if you pray, it's when 
you pray. And we've seen this in our study on prayer to this point. It's all the way through the Bible. Paul uh, had this to say, 1 Thessalonians 5. He said, pray without ceasing. To those in Colossae, Paul said, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Jesus had this to say in Luke 18. He said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Jesus said, listen, in that moment of crisis, you've got a couple options. You can faint or you can pray. And he says you need to pray because that's the avenue through which God will begin to work in your life. We're thankful for those words from Jesus. In addition to general commands about prayer, we're directed in the Bible to pray for the nation in which we're living. For us today, we're living in this nation, and God teaches Christians, his, his followers, that they are to pray for the land in which they're living. First Timothy 2 has this to say, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Paul told this young pastor, Timothy, hey, Timothy, pray for the nation in which you're living. What's interesting is Paul would go on to say, and Timothy, you're going to have to endure hardness As a good soldier, did you know much of the hardness faced by the first century church was the result of an oppressive government? And Paul said, listen, pray for them and endure that as a good soldier. The idea, friends, is this. Regardless of your party or political leanings, God implores us to lift up our leaders in prayer. When point one of your sermon is because God said so, you could probably wrap it up right there. But there are other good reasons found in the Bible. So we must pray for our nation because God commands it. But also, secondly today, we must pray because it is a spiritual weapon. All of us today are in a battle, not not a physical one. We are all in a spiritual warfare. The, The Apostle Paul had this to say in Ephesians 6. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Friends, there are real and tangible wars raging, spiritual wars that that are raging, and we need to understand there's a spiritual underpinning to, to all of this. And when we understand the spiritual nature of our warfare, we we can begin to understand the spiritual power that God has made available to us. Paul had this to say in 2 Corinthians 10. He said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. After Christmas, Lisa and I, uh, Lisa and I got away for a few days and uh, went to Colorado where our family's farm is and we had a great time. It snowed and snowed and snowed, and uh, we enjoyed that. We'd come in and out of the drive every day, so we kind of kept the snow pushed down enough that we could get in and get out. But man, that night before we were supposed to leave, the winds kicked up, and uh, it just pushed snow everywhere. And there were snow drifts that were pretty deep, and it came time for us to leave the next day, and I got in the old Ford F-150, you know, and put it in four low and was looking forward to an exciting ride away from the farm. Uh, I employed the mighty, mighty power that that engine of mine provides. And uh, when I got through the little area protected by the trees and got out along the field, I promptly got so stuck, you can't even begin to imagine. <laughs> I drove into four feet snow drifts, and I had enough steam heading in that I got in so far, I could not go forward, I could not go backward. The wind was still blowing about 30 miles an hour, and I did all I could do. I sent Lisa back in the house, and I was out there with a shovel, digging and digging and digging for one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. It was hopeless. Needless to say, we did not come home on the day we had planned to leave. I dug and dug. I was freezing to death. I, honestly, I've never been so cold in my life. I tried to talk on the phone outside, and I couldn't get the words to come out. I was freezing. I said, this is crazy. I'm, I'm going back in the house. I finally called my, my uh, uncle, and I didn't want to call him because, you know, everybody thinks Californians are weird to begin with, but when you come to Colorado and you get stuck, they, they, you know, they think he's not too smart, and, and I'm probably not, but I didn't want him to know that. And I, I called my uncle, whose name is Steve. My name is Steve. I said, Uncle Steve, I am so sorry to bother you. I said, man, I, I dug and dug for hours today. I, I was supposed to leave today. I got to get home, and I, there's no way. I, I can't even move. 
And uh, he said, I'll be right there. About 15 minutes later, he pulled in in his John Deere tractor, you know, just huge four-wheel drive tractor, like, I don't know, probably eight or ten foot tall uh, tires, and he had a blade on the front. And uh, in, in no time at all, he, he cleared the whole area and provided a path that could get me from where I was to, to the road that was maintained a little better, and uh, I was thankful for that. And, and uh, he, he looked at me out there. He was doing the big stuff, and I still had my shovel just trying to get a little bit more from under and around the, the truck. And, and, and he said, you weren't going to dig out with that shovel. You never would have gotten out of here. He said, I wish you'd have called me sooner. I would have helped you and you could have left yesterday. Maybe you can relate with what I'm about to say. A lot of times in my life, I feel as though I'm living with a shovel when God has made a tractor available to me. Prayer is what accesses the power of God. Just as that phone call was communication with someone who could come and help me in a situation in which I was helpless, prayer is our way to go to God, admitting, God, without you, I can do nothing. I need you. And, and yet so often what we do is we work and we worry and we get filled with fear and, and anxiety. And, and friends, today we need to hear God. You see, it is God who has said in Jeremiah 33, call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said that we should pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You see, when we go to God in prayer, our hearts should be, Lord, we want to see your work unleashed in our world. We want to see your work unleashed in our nation. We want to see your work unleashed in our lives. Prayer is an admission of our unbelievable need for God. Without prayer, we live powerless lives. Prayer is the access to the power God has provided for us. So much of the chaos we're seeing in our world today really is a testimony to God's unfolding plan. He told us preceding his coming there would be tough times, and, and we're seeing those. Paul, in writing to young Timothy, as I referenced a moment ago, he had this to say to Timothy. He said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of, of devils. He, he also said this to Timothy. He said, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. But as we live in the midst of peril, on occasion we need to be reminded that, that the peril is to direct our gaze to God. We are to acknowledge that these problems, these difficulties, this adversity, it's much bigger than us and we need to look to God. Friends, the battle we face today required God's power, and again, prayer is that access. When I look back over my life in those times where I was most dialed in in prayer and prayed with, with the most passion because of a big need, it was a fever that wouldn't break in one of our daughters, it was a family member that was struggling, it was, it was something of that nature that, that led me to prayer that way. You see, as we sang today, prayer is how we fight our battles. We don't look within, we are to look above. That's not unique to me, that's for you as well. That's how it was for Nehemiah. Nehemiah lived in a time where his nation was undergoing incredible adversity and difficulty. And Nehemiah had an opportunity as he heard of all that was going on to do any number of things. He could have worried and, and fretted and, and had fear and anxiety. No, but what he did do was this. He went to God in prayer and the result was this. In the midst of incredible hardship, God did an incredible miracle. Let me just share Nehemiah's prayer with you. Let's just kind of tiptoe quietly as, as we have Nehemiah now on his knees before God. Here's his prayer. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We've dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. The rest of the story is this. God did hear his prayer and God worked in his life. 
He came to God. He admitted, God, listen, we know we don't measure up to your standard. We've sinned. We've fallen short. And God accepted his prayer and began to work. And listen, no, prayer does not mean that we go to God and and that God will then do what we think is best. No, prayer is going to God. And as a result of it, it, it unleashes God's capacity to do in our lives what he thinks is best. The heart of our prayers needs to be as it was in Christ's prayers when he said, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Prayer is a weapon we do well to use in every area of our lives, including our nation. The third reason I'll share with you today as to why we must pray is because, number three, prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. Now, I'm so thankful I'm not called upon by God to explain to you how that works because I don't know. But it does. And I believe it. I know the Bible's filled with examples of people who prayed. And as a result of that prayer, God did a change. He brought about an incredible result. I mean, time would fail, but just a few examples. Think of Israel. They're in bondage and captivity, living in Egypt. They they cry out to God. And the Bible says that God heard their cry and, and led to an incredible liberation by way of the power of God. I think of Hannah. She prayed to God. She wanted a son. She prayed to God. She prayed to God, and and God heard that prayer. I think of David. He prayed for forgiveness and recovery after an incredible moral collapse in his life, and God brought restoration. I think of Hezekiah. He was at death's door. He was going to die, and and he went to God in prayer and said, God, I want to live. I'll serve you. I'll praise you, and and 15 more years of life was given to Hezekiah. I think of Daniel. He, He was a prayer warrior if ever there was one. I would imagine he was praying quite a lot and with quite a lot of passion the night he was there with the lions yet it was in that moment that God liberated him and gave him gave him freedom on I could go the point is this prayer changes things James had this to say he said you have not because you ask not and the implication of this is that we can have what God would have for our lives if we ask or we can fail to ask and things will remain as they are without God's touch How many of you believe that our world, our nation, could use a touch from God? One author had this to say. He said, to get a nation on its feet, it needs first to get on its knees. I want to help your perspective today. If you're still listening, say amen. Amen. I want you to get this perspective. As God led Peter in writing his first letter, this is what he wrote. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. There's a lot in that verse, but there's just two words I want you to really grasp with me to help in our perspective as it relates to the message today. The two words are these, strangers and pilgrims. Peter here is writing under the inspiration of God the Spirit to the dearly beloved. He's writing to people of faith. And he said, among other things in this verse, guys, you need to know something. You are strangers and you are pilgrims. And those two words describe our lives right now. What's a stranger? Well, it is someone who is not at home. It literally means this by definition. A resident who does not have citizenship. Another definition was a resident Alien. That, that's a stranger, someone who's in a place that is not theirs. Then the word pilgrim is used. That's referring to someone who's heading home. And the Bible says this to people of faith. We need to understand this. Today, in this world, in this nation, we're strangers and we are pilgrims. Let's not forget that. Paul really emphasized that in Philippians 3. He said, for our conversation or our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For those who know Jesus, this world's not our home. We're just passing through. We're living in spiritually hostile territory. We're resident aliens here. We are citizens of heaven who are here on assignment With that in mind, I want to go back to an occasion in the Old Testament to help finish off this perspective. Think of a time in the ministry of Jeremiah. God's people had been taken out of their homeland because they turned their backs on God and and the judgment came. 
as they were living as captives. They had a measure of liberty as they were in this new nation now serving and, and, and living in that way. And, and so here they are, but they had a sense in their heart. We're just biding our time until we can get home. We're living in a difficult time, but one day we're going to get home. We're strangers in this land and we're pilgrims. We want to go home. But it was in that occasion that God looked at strangers and God looked at pilgrims, his people, and this is what God had to say. He said, and seek the peace of the city. I'll remind you, they're living as captives. God said, seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. This message I'm preaching today could resonate in any country, but I'm speaking today primarily to people living in America. And I would remind you today, if you know Jesus, we're in this land as strangers, we're resident aliens, our our citizenship is in heaven, and we're pilgrims. We're going to pass on out of here one day and go to our eternal home but in the meantime the heart of God for uh, uh, times like this is that we would pray for the peace of the city because as we do God can then bless that place and in the process of that we'll be blessed see our nation today has many needs but none of them is as great as a genuine touch from God in the form of what we call revival so often as Christians we love to gripe about how they're how other people are doing it or not doing it. And and yet revival is something that begins in the heart of those who know God. There's a role for us to play in this nation that only we can fulfill. It's all about Christians who will passionately see their need for God, confess and forsake sin, plead for God to work in our lives and in our world, and and we must obey his word. That is what America needs today. We need to stop pointing our fingers at everybody else who doesn't do it or think the way we do, and we need to say, God, I pray that you would bring to this nation a revival, a mighty touch from you that would lead to incredible change and God help that change to begin on the inside of, of me. I think of a great verse that highlights this so well. And the Bible in 2 Chronicles 7 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. My friends, we need to be people of prayer. And one of the main reasons is because prayer changes things. An honest history of our nation's war for independence would tell the story of many, many Christians and churches that got together and were really seminal in in that fight. There was a real awareness in the hearts of those early Americans. Man, we've got to have God. We're up against the preeminent power in all of the world. We, we need God to work on our behalf, and people would, would pray. In fact, historians tell us that even George Washington routinely prayed for God to work in his life and give him wisdom and, and to help in the course of battle. But after the war was won, that sense of desperation for the touch of God, it diminished In fact, the war ended in 1791. By 1780, our nation was in an absolute spiritual freefall. Alcoholism was rampant. Bank robberies were a daily occurrence. Women did not go out at night for fear of assault. This nation that was so dependent on God at its founding just a few years later thought, well, we got through the rough time. We don't need God anymore. And and the spiritual decline happened immediately. Baptist churches were seeing no spiritual fruit. Methodist churches, which were greatly used of God during this time in history, they were losing about 4,000 members a a year during that time. It was in this era in history when, when Voltaire famously said that Christianity will be forgotten in 30 years' time. It was a desperate, desperate time. People were wholesale turning away from God. So soon removed from a really incredible beginning, they were already turning their backs on God, it, it appeared as a hopeless situation from a spiritual standpoint. But during this same time of decline in the United States, in Europe, some things were happening. And in Great Britain, we know that in England, Scotland, Wales, and in Ireland, there was a great revival taking place. Revival speaks of new life, and Christians had had come to the Lord in commitment and dedication, and God had lit a fire on the inside of them. It's been said, if you light a Christian on fire, other people will come around just to watch him burn. 
And these Christians were passionate about God and they, they loved the Lord and they shared the gospel. God used their lives in an incredible way and people began to get saved by the thousands. An entire continent was being reshaped because Christians went to God in prayer and lived for him. As that was happening in Europe, back here in the United States, a, a discouraged pastor heard of what was going on there, a man by the name of Isaac Bacchus, and, and he came to understand that this revival, it didn't just happen spontaneously, he learned it had been preceded by long seasons of prayer. So this pastor made a decision, we must pray, we must pray, he, he called people together. He, he called these prayer meetings concerts of prayer. <laughs> concerts of prayer. In 1795, people began to pray and the meetings grew. Admittedly, not much seemed to change initially, but, but the people began to pray. By, by 1798, revival came and it lasted for 50 years. And, and in that time in America, church membership increased tenfold. Each year, four to five hundred churches were started just, just in the colonies. It, it was incredible what God was doing. In 1770, there were 20 Methodist churches in America. If you make your way to 1860, uh, there were 19,000. It was incredible what was happening. Baptists, too, saw thousands reach for Jesus Christ from 1815 to 1840. They averaged, just, just the Baptist churches averaged 40 to 50,000 conversions a year. Revival had come. The, the situation looked hopeless. It was so desperate. People had turned from God. And the revival came from God, but it came through the prayers of one Christian who said, we're not going to be able to fix this mess on our own. We need to pray. I've pastored long enough to know if we want a service with a very, very small attendance, I'll just announce it's a prayer meeting. But they prayed. They prayed. Some have described true revival as falling in love with Jesus all over again. Not doing any of the things you know he would not want you to do and only doing those things you know bring joy to his heart. I want you to imagine with me today what could happen in our time and our space if we simply comprehended that Jesus taught us that prayer is the expected part of the life of every Christian. I'm happy to read about revivals in history books. I'd prefer to experience one. Imagine if we saw the powerful weapon that prayer truly is. Well, prayer, it's the least we can do. No, it's the most we can do. Imagine if we saw prayer as the incredible power that it is. Imagine if we believed that praying to God in heaven could change things in our world, in our nation, in our church. In our lives I'd imagine if we truly felt that way we'd begin to see that spark of new life of reviving maybe it would begin in one of us or a few of us and that flame could spread and an impact could be made why after thought and prayer did we decide to move forward in our church's building program although we stand in need of a miracle because we happen to believe that God can work through us to make a difference in our world. And we must pray. Our Father, we're grateful today to be in this place and to open your word and to be reminded of something that most of us who've been in church for any amount of time at all would say, yeah, I already know that. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be people of faith who more than just know things, we would obey and follow and do. God, help us to pray. Help us to pray. Lord, we spend a lot of time complaining and griping and debating. And Help us to pray. 
Help us, dear God. Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.